It begins with a brush and some paint, or it starts with a pencil and a blank space, or before that, an image in one's mind, and before too long, a wash of color, a line, and a welling up of emotions released, called forth, let go, as if one's heart is lightened or ignited by the seemingly simple act of creation. In this AIB Presents, What Art Reveals and Heals, you'll meet several people who have used art for healing and in turn been healed themselves. We first met artist Brian Bear at an exhibit on diseased eyes, photos by Kenneth Thompson, an ophthalmic photographer. Bear worked with Thompson for two years to create the exhibit, which was displayed in early 2016 at the Southwest Arts Center in Atlanta. So when he brought it to me and he brought these images and they were so beautiful, I said, man, those look like paintings or, you know, like some pen and ink or, so, you know, like some ink or, or, or marker drawings or whatever, you know, uh, manipulated Photoshop kind of. And, um, and he told me what it was. He told me what the use of the goggles, how you can see the illnesses and diseases in the eyes. And so we started working on it. He had all the images. He just needed to add the text and all the information to document basically every different disease in the eye. The exhibit attracted attention from doctors, med students, and from those with diseases that can lead to blindness. So it's been great. We've had um, a, a guy came in the other day. I said, how'd you hear about the exhibit? He said he's a, um, he's a, he's a diabetic. So at his diabetic center, they actually had the information. So he came to check it out. So by us collaborating with Visual Arts and Health and Wellness, I reached out to Fulton County Department of Health and Wellness, got them involved. So they've been you know, passing information out as well to the to health and wellness facilities and centers, um, passing like literature on different diseases that this exhibition actually is uh, pointing out. So those patients have been coming, people have been coming in droves to see this exhibition, which is great. Bear himself had a connection to the exhibit, a personal and sad one. It was a cousin of mine, uh, Jason Woods. We grew up together in Los Angeles and um, he, passed away some years back um, of diabetes. And um, it was like post-college. He went to Chico State in California, and when he got out, he had developed diabetes. So, um, you know, he was really not taking care of himself. Um, so when he had got hit with it, and he didn't have a stereotypical diabetic look about him either, but um, he could have made the difference and changed his situation. He didn't. He passed, and it was a sad situation. He left his wife and his son, Jason Jr. Um, so when Kenneth brought this to me, we talked about it. I said, man, you know, I had a, which I, which I, what I told him was, I wish my cousin Jason could have seen this prior to his demise, you know, because it maybe would have helped him out a little bit to see, man, you know what, maybe I need to get it together. But Kenneth wanted to bring out his arsenal of images that would, that would give people that feeling of, um, I need to get it together, you know, almost scare him a little bit. But talking with Bear, it turns out, there's more to the story. Art is not only a constant in his work life, but central to his own emotional healing. Art is uh, like, art is, uh, is my, um, it's my passion. It's something that I, um, that is a part of my life that has to exist. I mean, I, I'm, it's, I'm, I can't wake up and not have it in my mix. It's, it's therapy. It's a, it's a uh, for sure release on the day to day or from the day to day. You know, it's a way to uh, move forward and, you know, it's like getting ideas out and it, that stuff balances me out, you know, when I can, whether it's sketching, drawing, or whether I'm completing a piece or working on a piece, you know, from start to finish. It just, it's a part of my mix that I have to have in my, in my, in my life. So art has been there for you in the day-to-day -day stresses and it's also been yes. there for you after a pretty traumatic thing in, in your life. Yes, it has. It was um, after my wife passed uh, from breast cancer. We were both in our uh, mid-twenties uh, when it happened, but um, I was really just really trying to uh, get my feet situated into Atlanta in the art scene. I had contacts here, you know, I was trying to just get settled. I started working at <clears throat> the Southwest Art Center. And, um, and um, we were just really trying to get ourselves ingrained in the city, bought a house, two young kids, we're moving forward. So during that process, yeah, and it, and it, it 
stopped me from producing work like I produce for a little while, not too long, because like I said, it's so much a part of me, I had I gravitated back to it, but it was more of a healing. It helped me come out of that depression, that place, that stuck, you know, it was just, I was stuck and it wasn't me because I'm used to creating, I'm used to having concepts. I consider myself more of a conceptual uh, artist. So I, you know, I work off just concepts, whether it's inspired by music or inspired by song or inspired by life in itself. Um, so that, <clears throat> I never had a problem coming up with concepts or pieces, but during that time, I couldn't think of a piece or conceptualize a piece to save my life. And it was, and it was almost like I was like, man, I felt awkward, like walking outside with no shoes on. You know, like, wait, hold up, I forgot something. You know, it was like, I want to work on something, but what can I work on? And it was nothing to, it was nothing there. So I started going back through my sketchbooks and looking at older pieces, <clears throat> bringing those forward. Um, but then also being inspired by those old pieces and saying, okay, let me <clears throat> just consciously work on something. I have to, and that's would help bring me out of that fog. He admits his work wasn't up to par during the depths of his grief. They just wasn't, it wasn't a clear thought. It wasn't a clear uh, message. It wasn't saying anything. It's just something that, to, just to do. Um, the good thing about it was I needed to do it just to get to better work. You know, to, to me, I'm, I'm a forever student and I'm gonna always be pushing forward um, with, you know, even if I'm, I might like a piece a lot, but I'm like, okay, the next piece, you know, what's next, the next piece. So I was in that, and once I got back on track, it w I was good, you know, because it, it, again, it just got me on track with producing work consistently. You know, okay, that's, that's, that's not so cool, but let me work on the next one. Uh, and then eventually I got to the point where the pieces started speaking to me. They started, you know, it was like, okay, this is it. And once I got back in that flow, they, the images, the concepts came to me much easier. And, and I, I felt, okay, now I'm, now I'm a little more comfortable. I'm home. I'm home now. So work on the next piece. Okay, yeah, I like that. Then I would get critiques from professionals by my colleagues. Like, hey, man, check this out. You know, what do you think about this one? You know, what are you trying to say? Well, this is what I'm saying. Okay, well, hey, yeah, da, 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 da. give me a little feedback. Okay, work on the next piece and, and so on and so forth. And that was, that process kept me, it kept me active. It kept me moving. I was getting in exhibitions. I was organizing because I'm a curator as well. So I'm organizing exhibitions. <clears throat> and eventually we got back on track. I mean, I, I had got to a balance and that's what I was seeking, that balance that I was missing. I felt out of balance in a depressed state, you know what I mean? And coming out of it, just uh, I felt like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm back, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm back. To heal, Hebert returned to what he calls the basics. Was there any a time when you felt like mm -hmm. just maybe you taking paint and just throwing it at a canvas, like an anger or no. worrying about your... Because my process is, has always been um, very conceptual. So I wanted to, what I did was, in which they say when you're going through something really major, life changing, the best way to get back on track is to take it back to the basics. Take it back to the basics. So the basics for me was, and I, and I went to my fine art training, was pencil drawing, you know, which I never stopped doing, <clears throat> you know, ultimately for the setup of all these pieces, I had to draw it out or draw out several um, thumbnail sketches, you know, several little miniature pieces, you know, work them, work them in color, work them in, in pencil, just to kind of get me, you know, my color scheme worked out or, you know, figure out what I want to say. So everything is planned out and it's deliberate. So I'm used to working that way. So I wanted to get back to that, to get myself back to the basics, you know, and it, 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 and it helped because it took me back to the foundation. I started drawing a lot more, started getting involved with a lot more drawing exercises stuff that I had used to do but hadn't done in a while. <clears throat> so I said, you know what, okay. You know, once I got back into that drawing, you know, and, and started laying out, going off of my old sketches and started working on newer ideas and, you know, that old idea was great, but if I can, you know, um, evolve it a little bit, you know, and, and, all, and I, I knew all of this was like, because for me the goal, I don't consider like, oh, this is a masterpiece, this is a masterpiece, it's a piece that's, you know, like a work in progress. 
And when I was at that time, I was really trying to get my voice. So a lot of stuff I was doing in the beginning, it was um, it was more figurative. Um, it was um, it was one piece in particular that I worked on with my wife um, that I, that I felt was a like, speaking to her situation specifically, and it was figurative. It was um, very awkward, but it had um, her like kind of like her body in the, in the four middle foreground. Um, I had like it was like red and purples in the background. It was like a real depressed looking piece. I had like um, needles and like kind of like a, the you know injection needles in, was in the piece and you know just all this stuff that just was like it, you could feel it. It felt disgusting. It felt like really depressed. Um, but I showed it to an uh, artist who was this, over the sculpture department at Spelman, uh, Toby Martin. Rest in peace. He passed, but he helped me with the critique and also speaking to going through loss you know he had been through something similar uh, he lost uh, something special to him someone special to him <clears throat> and he spoke to how the getting back to his work and coming out of that and you know so i was like yeah so i i needed that critique at that time but it, it told me that i was going in a in the wrong direction you know what i mean and which was great it was it was crap but it told me I was going in the wrong direction. Again, it was going outside of me, per se, but it was something that at that time I needed to produce, like from a from a conscious perspective uh, and not a depressed perspective. Now I would, would approach it totally different. You know what I mean? And that piece, it was more full of emotion. It was full of hurt and pain. So it had to come out how it did. I needed to get the critique from Toby Martin in order for me to <clears throat> understand what I was doing when I'm putting out and how I'm putting it out for me to organize and balance myself out a little bit better. And it was great. What did you do with that painting? I, I painted over it. I studied it, um, but I painted over it. And, and I needed to, I said, you know what? It's like, okay. Because when we talked, he said, yeah, you know, you can keep it or you can paint over it. But the fact that you got it out, that helps. And it did. So from there, it's like, I felt like, like when you get over like the flu or, you know, you, the next day you might be a little sore, but you just feel really like better. You know, the sun is shining and you say, man, you know what, I feel so much better. That's how I felt. He's also created art inspired by hip hop, honoring indigenous cultures, addressing gang violence in his hometown of LA, honoring the young girls lost in the 1963 bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, all the while healing himself. So as I'm going through this journey, it, it helped me. It helped me really, you know, because I had something to look forward to. I had something other than just being a dad or just being a homeowner or whatever. I was like, okay, I can fix up my house. You know, okay, that's gonna take some time. You know, okay, I'm gonna do this. But <clears throat> I couldn't do none of that if I wasn't myself. So that's what this, and this, every time I came in here, music playing, work, whether I was off work or whether I was up at late at night, my kids were going to bed routinely at 8.30 every night. So I had that down. They got their baths, you know, I would, you know, I was combing my daughter's hair, washing her hair, blow drying her hair. My son, I was cutting his hair as well. I was packing their lunches because we, we have a veggie, like a vegetarian <clears throat> type of diet. We eat a little seafood, but mainly vegetables and fruits. So I keep fresh fruits and vegetables. I never sent them to school for the school to feed my kids. I fed them myself. I would always I would clean the grapes, fresh water bottle, you know, <laughs> every day. Cutting apples, so I would get up at night or in the morning, where they, right from when they went to bed, um, I would wash the dishes, I would put them in the dishwasher, I would get everything ready for the morning, iron their clothes, iron my clothes, all that stuff. So then I would, then I would sit down, take a shower, and then I would come down here with the intent to work for about three or four hours. And that's what I did. And I would go to bed, get up in the morning, and do it all over again. And although it would seem like I was killing myself, like, man, how could you do that? Dude? You know, because before I started on that schedule, I would come and I would sit on the couch because I was tired and I would pass, I would fall asleep and, and get, because <clears throat> it would be after I get all the household stuff done, I'll fall asleep. And I'd say, man, I didn't do nothing last night. So then that was kicking my butt. Routinely, I was like, man, you know what? I gotta get back. So once I started doing that, if I, even if I slept three hours, I felt great. I'm like, hmm, 
okay. So the next day, I would probably sleep long, like through the night. Then I would repeat that, what I did, the, you know, a few nights before. <clears throat> I said, okay, I got a system. You know, I just can't beat myself up every night. <clears throat> so I made the conscious effort to skip nights. And then after a while, I employed a technique. When my kids went down, because I would do everything early, like while they were getting ready, you know, because it got a little easier because I didn't have to give them baths. They would, all right, hurry up, it's time for you. almost, you know, I read them stories until they were able to read for themselves. And then um, once they got older and the, the technique started to change a little, so I said, okay, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to sleep when they go to sleep, sleep for like two or three hours, and then wake up at like 10, 11 o'clock and stay up until maybe three painting and then go to bed from 3 to 5, 3 to 5.30. And that, <clears throat> that was a great technique. It worked excellent. And I did that for a while, a very long while. I got a lot of work done like that. I was never tired. I would be super excited and super, because I would come in and I would wake back up after two hours, two, three hours, and look at what I've done. And I'm like, yeah, and the kids would give me their, say, what you think? I would get their feedback, <clears throat> and, and that, that helped me a lot. So this artist very, very much saved me, straight up. Once a month, once homeless veterans living at the Salvation Army in downtown Atlanta put brush to canvas. It all started with this man, John Fight, as his son Scott explains. We were started by my dad who had a very simple idea. He wanted to help people in hospitals. And so he was a veteran himself and went into Northside Hospital here in Atlanta and began to paint uh, with patients. And uh, he did a couple murals and then it, it really just caught fire and people realized that you can take blank walls and transform how hospitals look and feel. And so it went from you know, a depressing place to really brightening it up overnight. Since then, the Foundation for Hospital Art has expanded, gathering American servicemen and women around the globe as thousands of lives are touched and transformed one brushstroke at a time. I think art connects with us in a way, it, it almost takes us back to when we were young and innocent, and everybody was an artist when you were young. And then as you get older, somehow you just walk away from art, but the, everybody has a creative side. They don't want to admit it, but they all do. And, and there's a release in taking your hand, whether it's a pen to paper or a paint to, and a brush, to really release what, what you feel, and, and art allows you to do that. Charles Williams served in Korea and in the Panama Canal Zone. His life took a turn when he became an addict. Now he's turning his life around. I'm going to just be honest with you because my high power tell me to be honest. I just got with the wrong crowd and, and got addicted to cocaine. And it took me about 40 some years to break, to, to get myself clean. And the only way I got clean is through the grace of God. So I painted when I was in elementary and junior high school. You know, it just. It just thrilled me and it just take me back to my days, younger days, take me back to when I was a kid, you know, exciting. I like the paint. It's kind of give me, kind of meditate me. Just mellow me out. David Fields went into the Army right out of high school. I had orders for Vietnam and I was injured in a training accident two weeks before I went and uh, so I had orders a second time two years later, and uh, that's when we pulled out of Saigon. Back then, you, I can't say on camera what we were called. Um, you know, we we just we didn't get the welcome that that they get nowadays, and it was pretty uh, pretty disheartening at the time because um, we thought we had you know served well. I went through divorce two years ago, and. I had my own apartment, which was probably the worst thing that could happen to me. Uh, I was, I had one up in the mountains. I said I couldn't be bothered up there. 
and I had too much alone time. I was by myself constantly for two years nearly, and uh, it just, the depression just got too much for me. This was his first time painting with hospital art. The difference in, in uh, my, uh, I say, classmates here, and, and their mood, uh, this was, there were several people had bad attitudes, bad moods this morning, and it's just like it just calmed everybody, and as you can tell, we've got a lot of singing, and everybody is just, they're happy, they're happy right now. It's like most things that I used to do, it took me back uh, to the things I used to do. I, I played guitar for the last uh, 45 years, and you know, whatever I put the way I used to be, I put everything into it, and, and I had lost that, and, and this kind of brought it back today. And I just kind of wasn't here. I mean, I, it just it took me away to, to a better time. Gedalia Jenin, artist, Ayurvedic healer, knows the healing power of color itself. Each of our energy centers in the body, in the physiology, in the subtle body, it's called the energy body, is of the colors of the rainbow. And just in working with the color, I think there's some you know, something unseen that happens with this color that does affect the chakra, do affect the chakras in, our, in the body. And when I'm finished painting, it's like alchemy. It's like, oh, you know, I feel settled. I feel, you know, if, if you're not expressing a part of who you are, then it's gonna create illness. You know, I had lower back pain. I had all kinds of things growing up that disappeared when I started painting. Everything, all my, I had bronchitis, I used to have asthma, I used to have lower back pain, I used to have fibroids. And, um, you know, when I started engaging with the color and doing my healing work and doing this, all, all disappeared. Time passes, I feel kind of a washing away of my story, my worries. It's just like a, like a bath in my whole being. And I just feel, so good when I leave. Even if I just sit in my studio and just sit there and look around or play around with pictures that I've photographed. But when I come here, I remember who I am. Gedalia says art helped her navigate through the grief of losing her brother Jeff and helped her face her parents and society's expectations. What do you do with the anger or the, the fear or the, the rage or the, you know, you, you have to channel it in a healthy way. Um, and so this was a way in which that emotion can, can really move. Since I grew up, you know, looking around, wanting, you know, seeing, I grew up in an area a lot like Buckhead, and it was in New York and Long Island, and I just wondered why people had a lot of things, but they weren't necessarily happy. And so I, you know, noticed that and was seeking happiness in a different way and realized that I had a lot of things too and I wasn't happy. So what really is it that makes us happy from the inside and I really you know, went on this path to explore that and that's how I got involved in yoga and that was 30 years ago when yoga wasn't even a household word. So and it was, I started practicing yoga, but I still wasn't getting the inner experience that I was looking for. And then I was led to meditation. And then the meditation led me, you know, as I said earlier, to the healing arts and to the color and finding what was within. And today I could truly say I feel fulfilled and content with what I do, and it'll only unfold. So I don't have a specific direction. I just know that Everything I do, I do for the serving others. That's my only goal in life, is to help others. She also recalls, as other artists do, a feeling of not being good enough, a feeling that dissipates doing art. For me, this was the one place where I never thought that way. I mean, maybe internally, but I wasn't trying to be like anyone else. I wasn't trying. I was really giving myself a place to just allow myself to be, you know, and the result never mattered. I didn't care how it came out, and I framed it. You know, I framed some things that I look at now, I was like, there's so many mistakes in there, but it didn't matter. I celebrated the fact that I did something with my own hands, as my grandmother did when she came to this country. You know, she filleted fish on the Fulton Street fish market, 
You know, she got on a boat from Russia, not speaking English, and had the courage, and made a living with her hands. So my grandmother was always an influence um, to me, and you know, I feel and see her expressions of love, and um, you know, she helped raise me, and so she had such a great influence on my life. And so I respect the fact that she had strong hands, and she used her hands to, you know, to live. I love cooking, I love, you know, gardening, I love doing anything with my hands, so, and the healing work. And inspiration, she says, is everywhere, if you stop and notice. You know, for a while you go through periods of, well, what am I going to paint, or what should I do, or, and then you just let that be, and you let yourself get inspired, or I walk a lot in nature, and so I love seeing the beauty and the changes in nature all the time. And you know, from the littlest things to these little buds that are coming out now, and the closed magnolias, and you know, there's so much beauty outside. So we're in such a busy life today. It's like that saying of, you know, take time and smell the roses. It's really true. So I really do that in my everyday life. It's really important to me to get out in nature and to look and see and feel beauty. Nature is healing. Being in this color, being enveloped in the, whatever it is, if it's cloudy or sunny or raining, you know, this is nature. This is profound. You know, in Bali they say everyone's an artist. Um, they're raised that way. Um, I think everyone has an art expression, if it's cooking or writing or, you know, daydreaming or, it's, there's, there's art in everything. It's not just painting. You know, some people can draw art. Let's say my husband always says that. You know, I was, he was kicked out of art class and he said I had this horrible art teacher, but yet he's so creative in business. So I think we all have creativity. Our creativity, I think, is our divinity. Each of us are born with gifts to share. And, you know, we go through our lives with people piling on different, this box and that box and this form and that model and stamping us this, what should I become? And yet, and then you get to a place in your life, and if you're not in enough pain, like I was, to find out, you know, who am I really beside all these things? So meditation was that step, was that move toward expressing my own self, and then realizing that that self that I'm seeing is an expression of my higher self, my divinity, my gifts. So it's, it's transforming.